My artwork has been described as sculpture, fiber art, and light painting. I create site-specific artworks that integrate with the architecture. My work emphasizes interaction with light, movement, and changeability. This is my recent commission for the Blood Research Institute in Milwaukee. It consists of suspended strands strung with dichroic squares. The focus of this talk is to show how I got to where I am now. I tend to live in the present and dream about the future, so this topic gave me an opportunity to look back on my art career and see that the same elements were there from the beginning and have evolved through time. Light, color, movement, scale, new materials. Now let's go back in time and see my artistic path. I have my bachelor and master's degrees in painting. After I finished my master's, I moved to Manhattan and discovered that while I was studying painting, a revolution was taking place in the art world. Fiber artists were transcending techniques and materials, creating monumental artworks, not craft objects. These works belong to the mainstream of modern art, beyond craft. I found this new medium exhilarating. I was inspired by this photo of Magdalena Abakanovitz standing in front of her monumental work, dreaming that I might create something on such a scale. I took a class at Parsons School of Design where I had the good fortune to study with Francoise Grossen. I flourished in the class and wanted to learn more. I had seen photographs of Peter and Ritchie Jacobi's sculptures and was in awe. When I learned that they had defected from Romania and were coming to the United States for the first time to teach at Haystack School of Crafts, I applied and was accepted. It was intense and exciting. The first few weeks, the only English Ritzy spoke was, No good. Rip out. I have always felt that this experience changed my life. Years later, I attended a benefit for Haystack and everyone I met that evening said the same thing. It was a special place, hard to describe. We of course learned about art, but we learned more about ourselves and life. My life took a new direction afterwards. At first I worked with natural materials, wool, ropes, jute but soon realized that these were materials from an agricultural society and I wanted to use materials that reflected my urban environment and a technological society. I began experimenting with new materials. I met two other people who were also passionate about new materials, an industrial designer and a madcap inventor. One evening, the man cap inventor came to dinner, bringing a new material he had just discovered, iridescent film. He said, we'll use it for a tablecloth tonight, and then we'll see what you do with it. It had the qualities I had been searching for, interaction with light and changeability. Thin yet complex, it contained over a hundred layers of two polymers that work like a prism. It became my signature material. My goal was to make artworks that changed with light and air, to have a life of their own. I wanted to work outside, which was a problem living in a six-floor apartment in Manhattan. I discovered if I stepped on the toilet in my bathroom, I could climb through the window onto the rooftop of the brownstone next door. The rooftop became my studio for the summer. Many came to see the works, the inventor of the iridescent film, curators, gallery owners, photographers, a filmmaker who made a film, all stepping on the toilet and climbing out the window.
some with more grace than others. I was one of 10 artists invited to create a site-specific artwork for one of New York City's public parks. My installation was in a formal garden in Prospect Park, Brooklyn. I also exhibited works inside. This work shows the way the iridescent film works with light. The predominant color when the light shines on it is green and when the light passes through, pink. I installed the same 10 foot by 30 foot work in different ways for different spaces. Here are some of the other installations. I was one of 31 artists from 11 countries invited to participate in the Lausanne Biennale of Tapestry in Switzerland, the foremost exhibition for fiber art. Being in this exhibit and making friends with these incredible artists was another life-changing event for me. When I returned from Switzerland, I saw the History of the Computer exhibit at the IBM Gallery. I saw microchips and was dazzled by their beauty. To me, they are jewels. I began the microchip series. In it, I use the microchip as a metaphor for today's technological society. Microchips are small. The true beauty is revealed when they are seen through a microscope. Another inspiration was this photograph from an article on computer espionage. In it, a man has blown up a photograph of an existing microchip, cut it up into sections, and now is arranging it to form a new chip. I plan my work in much the same way. I scan photographs of microscopic views of microchips into my computer and rearrange the elements creating my own designs. Here is my design, and this is my microchip. Here is a detail. I had an exhibit at the Museum of Art and Design in New York City, Microchips Floating in Space. As you can see, each microchip has several layers. The work on the right was created for another Lausanne Biennale exhibition and then purchased by AT&T. IBM commissioned the work on the left. I prefer to create my microchips on a large scale. I created this work while I was at the artist colony Yado. It is installed in LA's Century City Towers. Life Patterns is in the surgical waiting room of the Beaumont Hospital in Royal Oaks, Michigan. It is a meditative and reflective artwork that fascinates and stimulates the imagination of the visitors. This is a detail. Here are more works from the microchip series. Notice that the artworks are geometric and complex, like the actual microchips. I was a finalist for a public art commission for the new Knoxville Convention Center. I was chosen to create two works in the microchip series. I completed my written proposal and maquette when I learned that the presentation had been postponed for a couple of months. I was excited to explore a new idea, the landscape seen through new technology. This was before Google Earth, so finding from above views of Knoxville presented a challenge. After some searching, I found an aerial photograph of Knoxville from the National Aerial Photography Program. I did a second written proposal and maquette for the presentation, and the From Above proposal was selected. It gave me a marvelous opportunity to explore this idea while being paid. 
a luxury artists rarely have. I selected two sections of the view of Knoxville as my plans. Here are the aerial photographs and my abstract interpretations. I included the Tennessee River, major roads, and the university. I was fascinated by how the grids of neighborhoods were defined by transportation, highways, railroads, and the river. As you can see, although it is an abstraction, it is surprisingly accurate. If you live in Knoxville, you can find your house or building where you work. This is a detail. I created a from above view of Washington, D.C. for the American Association of Medical Colleges. It generates much interest as visitors become involved looking for landmarks, the Capitol, the Mall, the Smithsonian, and the train station. This work is in the lobby of the Sheraton Hotel in Phoenix. It is inspired by a satellite view of the neighborhood around the hotel. When guests ask for directions, the bellhops like to use my artwork to point out the way. This is a detail. This is a from above view of Miami. Takeda Pharmaceuticals, a Japanese firm, purchased Chicago and commissioned Tokyo. The two works hang side by side to form a pair in its Chicago office. The most challenging and complex from above was Boston, which I created for the Spalding Rehabilitation Hospital. Part of the excitement of being an artist is the mystery. It's often surprising what surfaces from within. When I moved to Tucson, I marveled at our big sky and the incredible light. Clouds fascinate me. My work in clouds speak a similar language in light, movement, and changeability. I discovered a new material dichroic acrylic which works like a prism. The squares are clear and the colors appear and change by diffracting the light. It has similar qualities to the iridescent film but was even more beautiful and sophisticated and it allowed me to make works exploring light that were more permanent. This short film illustrates how it works. The Cascade series is a result of these experiences. It consists of suspended strands strung with dichroic squares 
creating cascades of light. This is the Health Sciences Library building in Blanding, Utah. I created atmosphere for the lobby. It is inspired by Virga, the rain that evaporates in the dry desert air before it touches the ground. It is a dynamic experience creating endless variations and nuances. There are approximately 6,000 squares suspended on over two miles of line. There are 900 lines in atmosphere. It is 11 feet high, 33 feet wide, and 4 feet deep. My focus was to create a work integrated with the architecture. The airy, translucent quality invites the eye but does not obscure the view. Cumulus was commissioned for the lobby of an educational center at the Columbian Park Zoo in Lafayette, Indiana. These two airy clouds create a rainbow of shimmering light. I created sun shower for the lobby of the Vernon Cancer Center in Newton, Massachusetts. The shadows and reflections expand the physical work and are equally important. I'm often asked, what's next? I am intrigued with the idea of creating works of many layers. Here is my first endeavor. Thank you. 